Harriet, welcome to Show Studio. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about um, Isabella Blow because obviously it's the Fashion Galore exhibition at Somerset House. Now you have a really special relationship with Izzy because you're related to her. Tell me a little bit about, she's your auntie, isn't she? Or she was yeah. your auntie. So it's quite, I think, I grew up in quite an odd setup. that there was this estate called Hills and there was the main house, which was Hills House where Izzy lived with Detmar, her husband. And then I think my mum and I, my sister and brother, moved around every house on the estate, but never for more than six months. We always used to go <laughs> back to the you know, touch base at HQ, which was Hills, and live there. <laughs> and I always had by my bed a thing of garlic, because Izzy convinced me we had vampires and ghosts. <laughs> so she'd always put garlic by my bed so I could take it round. And so it was, you know, I don't know if it was most normal relationship between aunt and niece and whatnot, but it was very maternal, she's a very maternal person, so she looked after us all. It was just a big commune or something like that. Mm. What are your memories of, of her when you were growing up? You mentioned the garlic, and we were talking, Alex and I were talking about her styling work before Alex Fury, and we said, you know, there's such a narrative aspect, she's such a storyteller. Was she mm. like that as an auntie? Was she always kind of inviting you into her, into fantasy? And Yeah, I think it's quite difficult for people, because people ask me that question the whole time, and then... I sort of don't really know that much about her work, I guess, except from what I'm told by you or what by people like Alex. But then at home, there was always a story to be told, or she'd be standing by the Arga, you know, even saw her in a pair of jeans once, but her <laughs> bum was completely hanging out. And she made the best potato pancakes I've ever eaten, best roast chicken, she did it in like half an hour. <laughs> and it was, that was the narrative, it was more about making a home and the transformation of Hills, the house, from before she came to after mm. is astonishing. She saved the house. Yeah. You know, it would have fallen, basically, if it wasn't for her. There were holes in the William Morris carpet. They were like, I think we had eight greyhounds running around. They, they sort of ruled the roost and the family came after the greyhounds. <laughs> Doors were always open, you know, and then she came and I think she put a sofa in and she put a plug socket in and just, you know, very normal things yeah. that a house actually needs. Hills was very important to her, wasn't it? She did some of her shoots there and she'd come for weekends when she was in London. Yeah, what, every weekend was up there. What was it about the house that she loved so much? What's so special about that place? I think it's a nurturing thing. Is he, it was a big nurturer and so she cultivated shoots, family. But that house was a project and I guess she grew up at Doddington and then was sort of kicked out of Doddington. So then she had someone like Hills to nurture and bring up and change and and Detmar and that whole family mm. and I think she was really good at it actually and the shoot she did there was just so funny I think someone was telling me the other day they were having supper and this guy came they saw a guy in the window and they waved realised he was on a shire horse <laughs> they said come in come in and they said I can't I'm on the horse and he went oh for fuck's sake bring the horse in so the, <laughs> the horse this big shire horse was on the William Morris carpet <laughs> lying down there all just eating and they just kept looking around going there's a horse lying down on the carpet behind us or when foot and mouth came, we had this uh, sheep called large, I think they're called black Welsh blacks, or soy sheep, like black sheep. And then foot and mouth came and the men in white coats come, and they just slaughtered them. So between Izzy and John Bush, who looked after the sheep, they just hid them in the house. <laughs> I think at one point we had 50 sheep in the house. So do you think there was quite a contradiction with Izzy between, you mentioned this kind of practical things like, you know, making amazing potato pancakes, but also this incredible fantasy world. Do you think that's what made her such a great stylist, being able to kind of unite? Yeah, but she had vision. I think that works in both extremes, doesn't it? Yeah. If she had vision, how you can make a normal day happen, how to get up at seven in the morning and put the kids to bed and take us all to school. You have to have vision to get a shoot up and running and people forget that there's a lot of practical, boring elements to doing a shoot. Mm. The Izzy would get down to a tea, you know, she make sure everyone's fed, Make sure everyone was talking as long as they'd been introduced, you know, just stuff like that. She was actually really, really practical, but just spent far too much money. <laughs> I think. Do you, you mentioned that you remember her in jeans, and I love that. And you said her bum was hanging out, so I presume they're maybe McQueen jeans, she's wearing bumpsters or something. But do you remember seeing her in her incredible fashion when you were growing yeah, up? Yeah, I used to dress up in them. We had a whole, basically, the whole of the attic, which is now my mum's bedroom, was just Izzy's clothes. And you have to walk up this tiny stone staircase, and there's two staircases. You either got the adults one or the child's one, which I still go up. And there's a door that's like <laughs> that big. You have to crawl through, and then you're in the attic of the whole house, and it looks over five counties and Malvern Hills. And then there's Izzy's clothes, just rails and rails. And I could just go in, 
put on anything I like. And I always remember her in them as well, but he didn't, I don't know, I didn't see very many, didn't ever see her in jeans and a t-shirt, but it wasn't abnormal for some reason. Mm. Like, she turned up to my school in whatever Izzy wore, you know, a hat and blah, blah, blah. And my mum would turn up in a boiler suit that said American Army on the back. And I'd just be like, cool, right. <laughs> that was so normal that everyone else blends into the background. Did you have any favourite pieces to dress up in? Did you used to wear her hats or was it more the clothes? That... What would I love? She had these Givenchy heels and I do not know where they are. But they were like platforms this big. They were red with sequins, um, black sequins. And the, the sort of the big wedge went like that. It was like a wedge of really, really heavy wood like that and then it had maroon laces and I remember wearing them and then my mum just went get them off you're gonna fall over but it's like <laughs> a big fall if you fall over on them yeah those and I really loved her sunglasses and really nice earrings as well you work in fashion now obviously is it growing up with someone like Izzy you mentioned you know every, she made everyone else just blend into the background is that what made you want to kind of come into the industry um, weirdly no I don't I think when something like what happened to Izzy happens, you sort of feel quite angry. So the only reason I got into writing before I got in, and it wasn't about fashion. I think I started writing when I was 16 for ID. And it was actually about six of my closest friends and how great they were. It was just quite a lame, actually, article. But it was called This Is How We Do It. And it was just about kids, really, mm. and the talents they had. And then, then someone else finds out you're Izzy's niece and they go, oh, I bet you've got a really good angle on that. And they ask you to write a fashion article. But I never really wanted to be in the industry. I mean, I really wanted to be a lawyer. And I still do. I really want to be a lawyer, but I want a really nine to five job. But no one will give me one. <laughs> <laughs> do you think she's influenced, maybe she didn't influence your career, but do you think she's influenced your style or maybe your attitude? Does she make me... Yeah. You know what, she'd murder me if she knew that I was wearing this today, but I Why? don't care. <laughs> because I'm not. Bands. <laughs> she made assistants cry by saying, you bloody lesbian wearing flat shoes. <laughs> she used to get really angry with people who wore flat shoes and no lipstick, so you'd be in a good book. Oh, excellent. I would not be today. <laughs> but I do, I think you learn a few key features, silhouettes. She went on and on about silhouettes, and now I get it, and I always have the same when I see something from Celine, I shouldn't ever say this. You know, something like Celine, a box shape and stuff like that. I can't, I can't ever imagine myself wearing it. I can't, I can't really understand shapes like that. I'm quite narrow-minded. But she taught me about a figure. Mm. And, you know, she had massive boobs, tiny waist. She had alabaster skin. You know, she really enhanced it as well. Mm. And she actually quite loved her body. She said she had a face like a dog, but a great body. <laughs> so she taught me that. So you have lots of happy memories, and she seems to have had a really positive impact. On yeah, you. I don't really have any sad memories. I think you probably blocked them out. Mm. She had a really good impact on me. She was really naughty. No banana was safe around my mum or my aunts. <laughs> Everything was a phallic object, no matter what it was. And I don't know. Yeah, we grew up. It was really, really happy. Mm. Harriet, thank you very much. Not sure, right? <laughs>